Everything fine? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. How are you today? I'm good. <laughs> it's great to be here. The, the jet lag is just, it doesn't know what to do right now. It's about to jump on me, okay. but because I'm fighting so hard, it's a little scared. Okay. So. Okay. So probably we should drink. Yes, we should. <laughs> Cheers. I wanted to start with Living in Oblivion because it's a behind the scene film and it, I think it's a good starting point to talk about making films. And um, it was a long time ago that I saw first Living in Oblivion and I saw it last week again um, as preparing for this panel discussion. And the first que a question that um, comes up is, of course, why the hell are you still in the film industry? That's a good question. <laughs> It's, do, it's, sorry, do you know the film, Living in Oblivion? Hands up? Okay. Okay, everybody uh, knows, so we don't have to sum it up again. Okay. You know, what's interesting about, about being here, Susanna, and, and, and seeing the films, you know, kind of, you know, in, in a group, is that it forces me to go back in, in, in my brain to remember what it was that excited me and interested me enough to commit four years, five years, to each one of these movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, an experience happened last night when I when I came out of uh, we walked into the theater for the last ten minutes of Living in Oblivion, and and it, it, was, it was it was quite startling and very emotional actually to see the audience laughing, mm -hmm. and then and then to fall into that group of people again, the actors and 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 what that whole experience was, and and your question is is a very good question, and I think that if most filmmakers were honest they would tell you the same thing, which is that there is a love-hate relationship with this medium. And especially if you're working on budgets that, that are very, very small. And everything is dependent upon ugh, getting it the first or second time. Because if you don't, you will never get it. Now, that to me is, is the greatest crime of, of Hollywood. Hollywood has all of this money when, and that's what the money buys for them. It buys them security. So if they lose an actor, well, they, they, they shut down for, for, for two weeks and they hire you know, somebody else. Uh, on a low-budget movie, you do not have that luxury. And yet, you know, your, your aims are just as high, perhaps even higher, because you're, you're attempting to create something real. You know, you're, you're not making a Hollywood piece of crap. I'm sorry. You know? Uh, and so that's where the, the agony of the filmmaking process and the people that you're working with, because I, I do believe that, that the film business attracts the most neurotic and crazy people on the planet. It does. Uh, uh, I don't know how many people know, but the, 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 first, the first cinematographer that I hired on my very first feature film, Johnny Swade, Johnny Swade. I hired him after months of, of, of looking for a, for a, for a cameraman. Uh, I had to fire him two weeks into shooting because I was getting footage that was out of focus, uh, shots that were poorly framed. I asked him what's going on and he kind of gave me some weird answer and I, I asked him again and he still didn't tell me. It ends up that at the, at the very end of the filming and, and I, I had to call him I, you know, and I said, listen, I just have to ask you, why, what were you doing? What were, I, I felt something very strange, what were you doing? And he broke down in tears. I'm not, this is a true story. He broke down in tears, crying. And he says, I was so jealous. You were making your film. I was intentionally sabotaging it. <laughs> well, that was my first film. Okay. I don't, you know, honestly, I don't know whether I have still completely recovered from that. <laughs> okay? So my point is, well, you know, I tried to, I tried to, you know, make another movie after Johnny Suede, which was a film called Box of Moonlight. That fell apart so many times, and and suddenly this crazy idea hit me, to to instead of instead of fight the 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 insanity and the intensity of, of the film business, make a film about it, mm -hmm. and see if that helps me, okay. you know. Uh, and this crazy little idea, it started off as a as a half an hour movie. Okay. And, and it turned into a, a feature film. And I mean, we could talk for hours about that. I know yeah. we, we can't, but um, yes, this idea that this medium, which is there to, to bring 
into existence something beautiful, mm -hmm. right? Can turn around in a split second and stab you in the heart again and again. And that, that's what the business is because it's a technical business. So not only, again, are you dealing with the technical problems of, uh, you know, a light going out right when an actress is, has, a, has a beautiful emotional moment. But again, like I said, the interaction of the people that are helping you on your crew, I mean, it's a miracle that any movie ever gets made. Okay. <laughs> but what do Nick Rave and you have in common? <laughs> <laughs> Nick Rave is um, Steve Buscemi. The film, actually, it's interesting. When the film showed in Berlin, uh, someone stood up and said, very outraged, uh, a, a man, I remember saying, you know, how can you show this, this guy as a film director? How can you show him this way? Look at him. He's, he's a nervous wreck. He's, he's sweating. He's, he's, he's not very much of a director. <laughs> And I actually got angry. I said, shut the fuck up. I said, you know what, have you ever been on a film set? This guy is closer to, to, to every director. If they would just admit it, that's what every independent director is like. Of course you're nervous, you're, you're frantic. Everything, you, know, you never sleep. Uh, you know, it is the most, it is, I mean, I actually think Nick Rev is quite calm. <laughs> but, uh, but I, I found out later that Steve Buscemi, yeah. behind my back, was <laughs> mimicking me. <laughs> I didn't find that out, that out until much later. <laughs> Which I found insulting, but also rather humorous. Okay. I think if I didn't use humor, I would use a machine gun. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's true. I think that, that humor really is just, is just a different, it's like when you step on a bar of soap and it goes like that. Well, you know, humor, it could go either toward the machine gun or to, to, to humor. Uh, for me, the humor is a way to, I think humor actually is more creative than, than anger. I, I can tell, I can tell in the films that I've made where the anger was more, was more dominant than the humor. Humor is actually, requires you to be in a state of, of acceptance. It does. You have to accept something in order to, 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 to be funny about it, right? Anger means you don't accept it and you're fighting it as hard as you can, okay? Now, there's certain things, there's a lot of things we should all be very angry about, no question. But um, in my films, I, have, I find it particular delight to, to, to lead the audiences in a certain direction and then drop something that, that surprises them and gives them a sense of pleasure uh, that's unexpected. And, and the, the, the places in my films that that happens still give me enormous pleasure. So um, I, I just think comedy and, and humor, it, it requires also a give and a take from the audience. The audience has to be with you. You can't be passive. Uh, and uh, I like that. It's, it's an engaging quality. Well, I hope that nothing that was said in here is taken by any way, by, any, by anything to be serious. Uh, it's all horseshit. And, uh, you know. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you.